Hi everybody. So this is going to be my uh, old school review of Journey to the Overland, which is currently uh, on Kickstarter for a revised version. So everything you see in this review may change or be revised when uh, the next edition comes out. But since it's on Kickstarter now, that's probably six months to six to 12 months away so i'm going to show you what the game is now and you will kind of have an ideal if it's something uh that would interest you and i'm going to try to do this from an old school review uh following the format uh used by questing beast so journey to the overland is what is called a solo tabletop role-playing game and the best way to explain what is meant by that is it's a solo game, so you can play it totally alone. Uh, it's role playing because you, it is it has all the typical aspects of a role playing game: characters, classes, uh, dice, uh, and it's tabletop because in order to play it alone, you actually will use a map, and you know if you want to use figures or miniatures. There are cards that have to be used with the game. And that's what allows you to play it alone is having the map and playing it on your table. So the, the game is uh, published by Overland Games. Its creator is Dino C. Ware. Uh, most of the art, the, other, the cover art is done by an artist named Louis Romano. Uh, it begins with just a basic introduction to solo role playing which is kind of interesting and unique because uh, you will find a lot of introductions to role playing, but this introduces you to solo role playing. And basically what it simply says is through the use of unique encounter cards, various scenarios and extensive use of non-playing characters, you have everything you need to enjoy hours of travels and adventures. So basically these are the items which are going to allow you to play the game solo. Uh, got some old school evocative art, which I really enjoy the art in the book. I mean, it is my book, so maybe that's a little self-serving, but I, I really, I really was careful about curating the art to make sure all the pieces, uh, matched each other, that they were, uh, consistent. So there's a brief blurb on the game master, which kind of basically explains if you want to use a game master for the game, you can do that. And what it, what that basically is simply saying is that one person can game master this game while another person plays it solo. And basically what they recommend that you do is uh, the game master will control the cards. So it says uh, an example of using one of these options would be a game master who decides to hand his players the encounter card he wishes them to have when they have encounters or selecting the weather and event cards for a day so there's there's three sets of cards that are that are played in the game there are encounter cards for when you're traveling there are weather cards which are pulled every day to show what the weather is and the weather in this game is very very significant on gameplay so unlike most games where weather is kind of an afterthought or a side effect weather in this game as in you know I would say anyway as in real life is very significant as to what you are going to be able to do it will tell you if you can travel it will tell you if you need certain equipment or supplies and so it will affect a lot of your gameplay because a lot of what you do is going to be dependent on what the weather is uh, this is something called the rumor theory and I this is probably more applicable uh, if you are using the game master which is why they kind of appear next to each other and what the rumor theory simply says is that anything that happens anywhere in the overland eventually everyone is going to know about as a result of a rumor the rumor spreads and within a few days everyone in the kingdom has heard of it and you know, that's generally true in life. I mean, I guess in some days it would have took longer. But typically, you know, even in Rome, you know, if you lived outside of Rome and there was a fire in Rome, uh, 
sooner or later it got out to the provinces and everybody heard about it. People would leave the city and travel three or four days and tell someone and then they travel three or four days. And that's kind of what the rumor theory says. And again, we've got some excellent art. Uh, there's a brief history of the Overland. Uh, essentially, the reason it's called the Overland is the Overland is basically not Earth. It's basically a world or a planet where various parts of different uh, different Earths or, or planets have come together and to create this world. And the people who live on the world really have no idea how or where uh you know how this occurred and kind of why they're here uh there's a native race called the native overlanders who are native to the original world at least that's what they they believe and then there are others who know that parts of their history came from earth right and so there's a whole mythology of a star that passed over and as the star went through the universe it kind of gathered histories or times from different worlds and they all kind of landed here and became the overland so uh but you can read more about that in there then there's a beginning play overview and basically what the beginning play is is it's just going to kind of tell you all right to start out here's some objectives now journey to the overland is an open-ended game so you can really you really don't need any objective to start playing other than you're going out and say you want gold. You would literally leave your town. Uh, you begin the game in a town. So you would leave your town and, you know, you'd hopefully try to encounter somebody or do something with gold. You could stay in the town and get a job. And again, remember, you're going to be able to do all of this solo. But as a beginning overview, these are kind of the five main objectives of your character long term right if you're looking at the long game so it says you can capture obtain one of the five weapons of power acquire gold to raise an army recruit allies overthrow the king of overland and defeat the wizard morkai uh i will get more into these as we go further into the rule book but that's just kind of the initial five things that you kind of will look at and say hey i think i'd like to do that one and then you're going to start. As a beginner level character, I will tell you in this game, you are not very powerful. I mean, this is like red box basic D&D. &D. You do not start out with much of anything. You're not going to be given your initial powers or initial anything. You're a character. You've got some basic weapons and clothing and money and that's it. So then we have a section on beginning play. Where it talks about pulling an event card, you pull a weather card, and this is you're going to be setting it up on the map. So as you lay out your map, you put your character in this starting town, the first thing you're going to do is pull an event card, you pull a weather card, you will come up here, you choose a daily action, you do your action, it says if you travel, you have to check for getting lost, uh, if you do travel, you have to check for an encounter. You then have to eat your meal and pay lodging, which is, you will have to eat meals every day in this game. That's very important as well. Like, you can't wait to the end of the week and subtract meals. Uh, I mean, you could, but you will have already deducted uh, malnutrition points. There's a pay taxes component here. I've never really used that or followed that much. Uh, I'm really debating whether to leave that in the second edition or not, but uh, I may build in some kind of component for that. And then there's check for Dragonflight every month. And if you've ever seen the movie Dragon Slayer, where I think it was once a year the dragon would like come out of his cave and like they had to give the dragon a female or somebody to eat, or else the dragon would come out and terrorize the land. And they had to do that once a year, or somebody would try to challenge the dragon. Well, that's kind of where this concept comes from, that there's this dragon in a cave whose name is Valron, and once a month he flies out and he attacks a town. Now, for most players, that will not affect you, right? You're not going to really uh, suffer anything, at least in this version of the game. It is being tweaked a little, but in this version of the game, if the dragon flies out, uh, you just keep track of where he's at, but... 
one of the other objectives in the game is you can try to defeat the dragon Valron. And one of the important things is you have to get into his cave. And what you're trying to do here is kind of more like, then you're going to go to the Lord of the Rings, kind of the Bilbo scenario, where you want to get into his cave and then attack him in the cave, right? And there's kind of an advantage built into the ruse if you can sneak in there and hide and then attack him. So when he flies out, this is your opportunity once a month if you're by the mouth of his cave to go in and attack him or wait for him to return and attack him. And really, you don't have to attack him. I mean, you can go into his cave, take gold, right? And there's a mechanic and how much gold you can get out. And then wait for a month. If you hold up in there for a month and try to leave again when he flies out again with the gold that you've gotten. Uh, I've never done that. I think there's like a mechanic where you might get caught. And Valron is very powerful. I will tell you that right now. He is not a D&D &D dragon where, you know, some wizard's just going to pop a spell and freeze him. And then, you know, some 19th level fighter's going to kill him. He's very powerful. But he does have a weak spot. Just like uh, Smog had. So, there's like a 1% or 2% chance you could always hit that out of 100. Alright, so if we get past that, we go to our daily actions. Now, every day you must choose a daily action. And this is kind of the list of them here. You can rest the heal wounds, travel, engage in a battle. This is kind of more advanced play if you're leading troops because there's a mechanic where you can get counters and you would lead your troops. You have town activities. You can go to work. Again, if you want to earn gold by a job, you can build or repair something. Uh, again, that's more of an advanced. There's, there's mechanics where you can acquire a hex and you can build property on the hex. You can acquire a ship and repair a ship. So those would be daily actions spent doing that. And the daily action in this game is kind of the, uh, it's kind of like the speed break in the game. It keeps everybody honest so that, uh, if you want to do one thing, it, it, you're not going to be able to do another. And that's just, this is kind of a mechanic that came from a board game, uh, or box board game called Barbarian Prince, where you had to choose what you were going to do that day. Uh, as you were trying to gather gold to take back your father's kingdom. So, you probably don't normally see this in role playing, but this is again part of the tabletop version of the game. Is that this mechanic has been incorporated into a role playing setting, and I use it more as a control mechanism. I use daily actions to control characters from just basically saying, oh, it's, 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 it's a year later and I've got a castle, I've got a hundred men under my command, I'm level 20. Well, you're not going to be able to do all that. Because every day you would have to have chosen a daily action for that year. And it just keeps people honest. This talks about what you start with, your goal places. This tells you what town you begin playing based on the race that you've chosen. Uh, now this is your old, uh, this is how you roll your starting characteristics. And I think this is kind of an old school mechanic where basically you're not going to be less than 20 in any statistic because if you roll zero, one through 20, you will add 20 to that. So even if you roll a one and it is a percentile dice game, which I actually got using the percentile dice from a game called Dragon Quest, which came out in the eighties. So even though like with D&D &D, they were using D20s, there was a line of games and Dragon Quest was probably to me the most popular one or at least the one that I, that kind of came into my my knowledge where they used percentile dice. And I, I created the game when I was 16. So as a 16 year old, it just, it was a lot easier for me to understand building the game from percentiles than using whether it was a D20 and you had used to have this like Thacko score, which I never understood what Thacko meant in D&D &D with the D20 and, you know, an 18. And so I just went with what they did in Dragon Quest, which was percentile dice. But you will never be lower than a 20. So even if you roll a one on your percentile dice, you'd have 
in any uh, characteristic or statistic. And if you roll higher than 90, you subtract 5. So again, that's kind of a mechanic uh, to make sure nobody's like uber powerful. Uh, then there's kind of a fist fighting damage, which is key to your muscle score. This page shows you your characteristic that every character has. It's very simple and very short. There is seven, I believe. And most of these, again, are kind of mirrored after the Dragon Quest game. So you have your muscle, your agility, presence, wisdom, luck, endurance, and ability. A lot of these are uh, are multi-dimensional, meaning, like for example, your presence score is a measure of your character's appeal, wit, charm, influence, and quickness of mind or observation. So this kind of encompasses uh, characteristics that would include uh, charisma. Uh, it would include things like charm, wit, uh, whether or not you you uh, you appear frightening. So you could have a high presence score, but not that doesn't necessarily mean you're very charismatic or you're very witty or appealing. You could just be like a very terrifying monster will usually have a high presence score because his presence w will scare you. So it's it's kind of multi-dimensional. Uh, Agility, for example, covers speed, grace, and mobility. So that would be kind of what you see in a lot of games called dexterity. Now these are your races. And in this version of the game, there's only uh, four races. So you can be a human, which, you know, is pretty much what you would expect. You can be an elf. Uh, and these are kind of your token elves. These aren't like your sprite or fairy elves. These are going to be more of what you would think of from J.R. Tolkien. Your dwarves, again, your kind of token dwarves. And then a race called the Overlanders, which I spoke about. The unique thing about the Overlanders is they have, they have minor uh, psychic abilities. And they have this ability called Mind Marker, where they can actually damage your damage your your innate characteristics and i think it's like your your uh is it your muscle score they can lower your muscle or agility scores through this mind marker attack but when they use the attack they actually take damage to their endurance so it's sort of like if you've ever seen a movie like firestarter where they use their mind and their nose starts bleeding and that's kind of what this represents the game talks about movement and your rates of movement for vehicles. Terrain effects, again, in this game, terrain is going to be important because you're moving across the map. So some areas you will need to wear coats, you will need to carry certain supplies, or you're going to suffer penalties. And that's all laid out here in the terrain effects. Again, that's kind of your, your tabletop component. So it's called a solo tabletop role-playing game. You don't normally probably see this a lot in role playing. You know, the GM is going to tell you if you're in a desert, well, you guys are, it's getting real, real hot. And he may say you need to drink more water. Well, in this game, it tells you either you, you take twice the normal food or meals or you're going to suffer damage because you don't have a GM. But there's some more information on the terrain. Again, you know, I do like the art. The swamps. Now... One thing I'll tell you about the game right now as it exists is my initial idea was to have a much larger map, right? I, I wanted the map to probably be one and a half times the size it is. Now, I think it's two by two now. My initial idea was to have it to be three by three. But as a result of it being smaller for a lot of reasons, just printing reasons, uh, there's not a very big swamp portion on the map. The swamp area is actually maybe eight six to eight hexes on the entire map but the swamps are actually a very interesting area there are certain creatures and events that you will not encounter anywhere else other than the swamps now when you go into the swamps there's a chance you can catch a disease called swamp fever uh you know you can encounter a swamp mummy swamp crocodile leeches some of these things giant lizard man you won't find anywhere else in the swamps and unfortunately i mean unless you go in the swamps and camp there 
you might never see any or use any of these rules in the game right now. In future supplements, because in a lot of the supplements that I'm doing now, I'm adding maps. I would like to kind of play more on the whole swamp territory. Uh, so we move on to a section called NPC Comrades. This is one of, to me, one of the most interesting and unique mechanics in Journey to the Overland. And I cannot remember where I got this from, if I got it from anybody. But uh, what NPC Comrades are are basically NPCs in the game who at some point you get such a high reaction to them on the NPC reaction table, which is kind of an old school mechanic, that you get such a high reaction to them and it says if you roll 96% or higher. So really there's only a 4% chance whenever you have an encounter that one of them will become an NPC comrade. But you get such a high reaction to them, they literally, you now control that NPC like your own character. And that's the best way I can put it. for Because for all intents and purposes, that NPC can do anything you could do with your own character. They can have events, they can get levels, they can get skills, they can travel, they can have encounters. Just like they were your own player character. Now, there are some exceptions as in, you know, if, for example, your player character dies, then they, they go away. You don't, you can't keep playing them. Uh, if they are separated from your player character for, I think, longer than a month, then they kind of wander off. Like, well, you know, they don't know what happened to you. But for the most part, as long as they're alive, I mean, you can spend their money and so forth. And this mechanic basically allows you to... It allows you to have a party, right? It replaces the normal uh, group session of of a role playing game where one guy is your wizard, one guy is your thief, one guy is your fighter. Well, what NPC comrades allow you to do is you now have a solo party. You're gonna have you you could get a, a thief become one of your comrades. You could get a wizard. Now, you can still have a party without NPC comrades. They would just be called followers or people who join your party. Uh, but this is more long term, right? Because a lot of the followers and people that join your party, there's things where like, say, if you get arrested, they leave. They're not going to sit there and wait for you to get out of jail. And you can get arrested in the game. Or uh, uh there's certain conditions, like some of them may only follow you because they're heading to a town, and once you get to that town, they leave. Others have conditions like, you know, hey, every time you see an orc, we must attack them. Like, maybe you're with a knight. And if you don't want to attack an orc for some reason, they're going to leave. So NPC comrades get around that. These are your characters permanently attached. So my recommendation would be, like, if you want to do some of the major objectives... Uh, defeat the king, defeat the dragon Valron, defeat wizard Morkai, you should probably try to build up a nice party of NPC comrades. Now, some of the objectives will tell you you must resolve this combat alone. You cannot have any help from a comrade. I think like when you get some of the weapons of power, it says you must fight this person alone. But there's other ones where you can use your NPC comrades, like fighting the dragon Valron. You know, you could get a wizard or something, uh, and then you have your own character, and it's going to increase your chances a lot. So next we get into the supply list, and I'm going to stop this here, and you know we're going to make this part one, because I'm getting into about 20 minutes already. And I mean, the, the rule book itself is... It's about 170 pages. So we're at page 18. A lot of the back of the rule book are kind of what, what you would consider scenarios. But for this kind of quick review, I just wanted to kind of go through part one of this for you. And then next time we're going to take a look at uh, this the second part. Thank you. Take care. And God bless.